and we are very fortunate to have a very capable female astronomer here <laughs> and she's now going to talk to us about politics, art and snowy dirt balls. Snowy dirt balls. Janice McLean who is also our editor of the comment section of publication The Comet Tale. Right, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for all coming back and uh, coming to listen to me because you've no idea what I'm going to say. I'm not too sure I do myself. Uh, <laughs> but this is just a little light afternoon uh, break to, to get you back into the, the swing of things. First of all I'd like to say special thanks to Nick for putting together a great day. It's been good fun so far. I hope you've all enjoyed it and I think he's had a hard act to follow after Jonathan Shanklin but I think congratulations on your first year as director of the comet section. There hasn't been a great comet yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh well. Anyhow, um, as, I, as I said, uh, I'm here to talk about politics, art and snowy dirt balls. Um, there is a quiz at the end. Has everybody got a sheet of paper? No, there is a little notebook going around uh, so that you can, um, I'll, I'll ask you at the end when the quiz comes up and you write on that. Okay, and um, if you haven't got a pen or pencil I'm sure you can borrow from your neighbour. But uh, it, it won't be too testing, but you do need the piece of paper and you will need to put your name on the top of it so as we can work out who it's from. <laughs> All right, that's just in case, in case the beer was taking over too much. Right, so when I, I got this, uh, Nick wrote to me and said, would you like to speak in the afternoon? And I thought, well, oh, crumbs, I don't know what I'll speak about. So I tried to get back to him and, and to ask him, uh, you know, well, wh what kind of thing would you really like me to say? But unfortunately, he was really busy at the time. Uh, and I thought, so, well, here we go again, back, back to my own resources. So I had to look at a few things and uh, I thought, well, you know, I could go maybe down the route of poetry and so on and so forth. And there's a, there's a lot of really bad comet poetry out there, let me tell you. But I found this, it's all about planning, preparation. We know that's what you have to do. You have to do that when you're doing your uh, presentations, when you're going to take your comet images, all in the preparation. This lady, Ella Wheeler, has been voted by the USA the worst poet that they ever had. Uh, she also wrote Laugh and the World Laughs With You, Weep and You Weep Alone. So uh, I thought, right, scrap the poetry, I'm not going to talk about that. But what I did get into is then looking at some of the art. And some of you may be familiar with uh, this very old stone. It's about 8,000 years old. It's an excavation in the north of Italy. And this is a representation, one of the earliest we think has ever been found, of comet up on the top of the, the stone. Has anybody been to see this? This. No? I've got all the gory details of where it is. Um, -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. I can give them to you at the end of the talk because the clock's running already and there's no pressure there, you know, with that ticking away in front of you. Anyhow, uh, this was, as I said, this is one of the earliest um, findings of, of Comet comet representation in these rocks by 8,000 years old. But then moving a little bit further on from that, uh, I find this excavation, this is Lady Di, not, <laughs> not the blonde one, which is the other Lady Di. Uh, she's not looking too bad considering uh, uh, how long ago she's fine. <laughs> but I don't think she's going to get up and give you a few words on, on how you measure your magnitude, whether you include the tail or the head. But um, anyhow, at her tomb was found a silk manuscript which was a copy of uh, various other manuscripts all put in. If any of you have heard of I Ching, it's actually a very well known ancient Chinese manuscript. Um, and this is called the Ma, Ma Wang Dui silk book and it came to light when they were excavating Lady Dai's tomb. Now what they find here is that these are all, and I don't know how to move my text up and down on this thing. Uh, all right, never mind. Don't give me something else to drop. Uh, <laughs> um, 
And what, what these are actually representing are individual comets. The Chinese characters actually say things like they mean things like general dies, rebellion in the state, state perishes, death in the state, all sort of political statements about what that comet might have meant at the time. Uh, some appearing in spring and so on and so forth. But the interesting thing about them, as most of you will have noted, is that the comet's tail is pointing away from the sun. And the interesting thing of that is that the Chinese discovered this so many thousands of years before it was accepted uh, or discovered, for want of a better word, in Europe. In fact, not until the Renaissance. So, very interesting manuscript. And, and uh, I find it uh, interesting in the political aspect of how comets were not just pretenders of doom, but a comment upon the uh, things that were happening in the times. So because I've only got 25 minutes, and you haven't actually set this clock, by the way. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> I shouldn't have told you that. Oh, I've started it now. Um, <laughs> uh, I live down in the southeast uh, uh, of England in Kent, and I'm a, sort of an adopted uh, Kentish maid, uh, originally from Belfast, those of you who are still trying to work out the accent. And I, I particularly like this picture because this was painted by a Scottish artist, William Dice. Um, who was also uh, very interesting, interested in geology and astronomy. And can anyone actually see the comet that's on the picture? On the W. Yeah, it is. If I could work the pointy stick, you could see it just under the, the W there. And that's Donati's comet, which caused a lot of comment in the media, in art, uh, at the time. Um, and you can see he was a geologist because as he's painted this, he's, he's made a great point of putting all the stri uh, striations and the, the uh, uh, detail in the rock as well. And this is his family, so it was a recollection of a day out um, with his family here at the front. And you can see this painting, it's in the Tate Britain. Yes, it's Donati. Uh -huh. So, um, at that time then, it was paintings that were how we got our news and paintings that made comments on things. I'm going to get really mixed up comments and comments here. I can see it's post-lunch or going to mirror into one. But the, um, the fear then was with the advent of photography and how that might take away the visual interpretation of what was happening. But whilst photography was still developing, of course, we had coming into the sphere the arts and crafts movement of William Morris and ultimately then that led to the, um, the pre-Raphaelites that some of you may have heard of and particularly uh, Burne Jones, who painted around this time. Now, he was also a very keen astronomer, um, and he painted um, lots of uh, sort of Arthurian legend type paintings and put in stars, put in what he saw in the heavens and so on and so forth. And he, the, the, the reasoning behind what the pre-Raphaelites were trying to say was that they, they, saw, they thought that photography was going to take imagination away from the visual arts. But as we've seen in some of the earlier talks, I'm not so sure. When, once you get into <laughs> serious imaging, you can do what you like. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't really mean that. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, and one picture that uh, particularly caught my mind was this one that he painted of Sir Galahad. Now, Sir Galahad of the Knights of the Round Table was Sir Galahad the Pure, and it was all about purity and, well, actually virginity, which was the reason that he found the Holy Grail because he was so pure and there's a very bad piece of poetry that Tennyson wrote at the time I, I, I had to smile when I read this my good blade carves the casks of men my tough lance thrust is sure my strength is as the strength of ten because my heart is pure uh, I never felt the kiss of love nor maiden's hand in mine and this was Tennyson uh, Tennyson stayed in a house at the same time as Burne Jones in London and they were very influential with each other on, on how one was telling the story through poetry and the other through art. So this in his hands is a comet in being held in the Holy Grail that he has retrieved 
and uh, again the comet is the symbol and thought of the, all that was also that was pure and clean and wonderful in life and, and as we know now comets actually aren't particularly pure nor clean <laughs> in fact <laughs> what did I say it smelled like it reminded me of uh, formaldehyde at a post-mortem but that's just <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly not sure that you could classify comets as virginal but uh, anywho so I, if you want to read more about that I'm sure many of you have any of you got this book yeah. Yeah, it's a lovely book it's still available on Amazon second hand if you, if you want and so on so there's a lot more all about the art side but really I'm supposed to be talking about politics so let's get back on to the, to the main subject otherwise I get told off again um, and when Nick asked me would I edit the Comet Journal um, uh, the Comet's Tale I, I really started to think well what can I do to put because my knowledge around comets is nowhere near what all of, of you have got so I just wanted to add something that would make it a little bit entertaining a little bit different so I, I started looking around I thought this was appropriate and this image is already uh, being brought up today uh, but when I got further on and I was just sort of you know wasting an hour or two or a whole day <laughs> looking on the internet to see what was there and I came across uh, this which I, I put in the the comet's tale and then I started looking further at the guy uh, Daumier who actually drew all these lithographs and so on and he was very much the sort of uh, political commentarist, common, commentarist commentator of the time similar to we had Punch and, and uh, uh, the, the sort of cartoons and lithographs that, that were going on. Caricaturist is one of the words that the French use and caricaturist in its nature means exaggeration and that's what they are. So here he's taking the mickey out of Mr. Babinet being terribly serious uh, and not being able to see what exactly was going on. So I have a few, few more of his. Um, Daumier, he was a very prolific artist actually and he ended up uh, he started uh, mainly doing caricatures and lithographs and commenting on what was happening politically at the time. He ended up actually being one of the leads into the Impressionist School of Art. So if you're looking at your Monet and your Manet and whatever, this guy is one of the ones that started. And he worked, his uh, father was ill very early, he had to go out to work as a young lad, only 13 or 14, in offices in the middle of Paris. And as he said at the time, the Comédie Francais passed by him. So every type of person uh, and, and character were there for his to see. And so they're all in the, the richness of his work. Uh, he did about 4,000 drawings, 4,000 lithographs, and any number of, of sculptures and so on and so forth. And again, uh, <laughs> I, I thought this was lovely. Poor old Victor Hugo, uh, he just launched his play, The Burgraves, and uh, it crashed and burned spectacularly, <laughs> which he used as an opportunity to, uh, to put in the, in the press. And there's another little one. Um, uh, they, they are, they're kind of sweet really these. They, they have an excellent website if you want to have a look at some um, I, I presume you can all rate that it's big enough to see uh, and then finally one about a German astronomer releasing a, a duck because the, the talk the whole time was this comet it was going to land on earth we're all going to die we're all doomed There's, there were lots of other images about what day it was going to arrive and, and, or, or what not uh, um, and uh, it really was quite funny and of course being French they always like to uh, take the mickey out of the Germans so I know <laughs> so uh, let me see where are we now and how am I doing for time um, oh yeah I stopped the clock you are my victims for the rest of the afternoon um, so <laughs> Uh, moving on from this, we then go back into the world of literature and this very, very famous quotation of William Shakespeare um, and again this sort of how comets come in uh, to foretell uh, a big event or whatever and uh, 
when I was looking through for who in a more recent political uh, scene I, I could uh, mention and bring out to you, I was thinking of this and I found an article about the time of when Margaret Thatcher died. Um, and this Barbara McDougall is a Canadian journalist, she writes for the Canadian Globe and the Mail, Canadian Mail, and she said, and I, I'll read this for you, when Margaret Thatcher died she was asked to write a, an obit, and she said of her, first she was one of the influences that led me to seek a political nomination in 1983. I had always been absorbed by politics, but my participation has always been as a volunteer, and by the early 1980s I was drawn to the idea of running for office, but still toying with the idea uh, of, of being writer. Margaret Thatcher burst on the scene like a comet with hair and a purse. Uh, like a comet, she lit up the world, and like a comet, she did not disappear. Uh, and she stayed around to change her country profoundly, and indeed the world. She and I bore not one wit of resemblance to each other, but in part because of her, I began to see myself as a serious candidate. candidate. Perhaps it was the woman thing and I finally pushed myself to take office and won. But after Margaret Thatcher, of course, we had another gentleman came on the scene. And I found this lovely one, Peter Brooks in the Times. Uh, how many of these faces do you remember now? I mean, <laughs> they were here and they went, there's poor little John Major running for his life in the front. God help his wit. <laughs> And uh, eventually, I went, it was such, but it was such a change. We had had the, the Thatcher government for so long. We'd had the Conservative, still managed to hang on with John Major, even after they ousted Margaret Thatcher. Uh, but then we had the Blair, or Tony, Anthony Blair, call me Tony. Oh, uh, I suppose, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, well spotted. <laughs> uh, so, and of course Hale Bop was hopping and bopping around at the time, and uh, the, when he was just about to take office, obviously, it being such a big change, and uh, most, I think all of us here are probably old enough to remember the, the Labour government coming in, and uh, what was said that, that the, there was... Um, I have a lovely quotation of one of his party members that were putting a, a, an event to celebrate him winning the election. Um, and I'll read it for you. The Hale-Bopp Comet was the talk of the time, even bigger than our incoming Labour Prime Minister. In the early summer skies of 1997, its shining tail was visible, even to people who had no idea where or what a comet might be. No one could get away from Hale-Bopp appearing before us for the first time in 4,000 years. In twilight and moonlight, it swished over the poles and the Poles, P-O-L-L-S. Uh, as one veteran organiser of Labour Jollies told the Times Election Day, this could be like a hail bop event, so people are going to want to be with their friends to see it. I think you'll see a lot of partying breaking out. So. Anyhow, time moves on, and uh, every, every dog has his day. Um, I'm not going to get too much into whether you're a Conservative or a Labour voter. Obviously, in Northern Ireland, we have our own setup, <laughs> which is suddenly becoming very interesting again. Anyhow, I did just, going on to, before I went to the next subject, I accidentally did land on another bit of very bad poetry. I'm sorry about that, but as obviously I knew we'd talk about Rosetta today, I, I thought I'd throw it in. But there was, uh, when uh, the feel I landed on, um, on the comet, there was obviously, it went all over the world. I mean, I was sitting watching on my television and watching the uh, control room and what was said and so on and so forth. The New Yorker took a very interesting uh, line on this and how the, uh, it became a very political event and all the speeches that were made and who said what. Um, and again, I, I have some little bits of quotation for you here. I won't, I won't go into what Andrea Akamatsu said at the beginning because I'd have to use a dirty word and 
I know I'm in the comment section, you're not allowed to use rude words, but uh, <laughs> as it came in later, um, this is uh, Anthony Lydgate who's just saying, but as the camera panned around Issa's live video field, skipped away to show an audience of mostly white-haired, grey-suited men and a fuller procession of politicians, aerospace bureaucrats and engineers who took the podium in turns and in various states of excitement. Jean-Jacques Dorin, Issa's French Director General, began by telling one of his colleagues that drinking wasn't yet allowed, even though there was a tray of champagne and orange juice circulated later. Later. then praised what he called the sum of team working between 20 nationalities, those being the European countries that collaborated with Rosetta, on Rosetta, Australia, Canada, US. Uh, Volker Bouffier, the Minister f uh, President of Hesse, the German state in which Darmstadt is located, called Philae's landing a miracle. Brigitte Zypris, Germany's aerospace coordinator, who's patched via satellite, called it a triumph for European unity. And Thomas Wright, as S's director of human spaceflight operations, let loose a series of awkward fist pumps. There were co sentimental comparisons of Apollo uh, uh, and adaptions of Armstrong. One small step for man and one long leap for a comet or something like that. So, <laughs> very cynical kind of view on, I mean, actually what was a marvellous and massive achievement for, for humankind. But unfortunately, as very often happens, the people who actually made it happen don't always get a look in at the end of the day. Uh, so moving on, we were at the election, we had... Um, we had the Conservatives, then we had the, the uh, Labour Party got in, and then, of course, we, the Conservatives got back in again, a kind of a bit of a coalition or whatever. But uh, eventually Cameron found his feet, and then he said, well, what a good idea, let's decide if we want to be in Europe or not, and held a referendum. And I find this, this is one of these... Um, Bible sites where they, they say everything's predicted and we all know what's going to happen and so on and so forth. And this guy, he's, he's an expert in California, uh, Dr. Jeremiah, uh, David Jeremiah of Shadow Mountain Community Church. Uh, he reportedly <laughs> made an emergency early morning phone call to Texas Pastor John Hagee. He said, John, have you seen the news? There isn't any, this isn't in any of the tables. He is said to have screamed into the phone. After calming Jeremiah down, McGee reportedly consulted a series of lunar charts taped across the bedroom walls and summarized that the Brexit decision had actually been accurately predicted in Halley's Comet <laughs> in 1986 before proceeding to scribble down some corrections on his favorite uh, eschatological time. Eschatological. eschatological. I, I, I thought I'm going to trip up on this when I uh, Timeline in a red marker. So it was okay then, it was all going to happen. Uh, and they knew it was going to happen, they just sort of hadn't quite got around to telling the British nation. Um, but then, of course, what, what was the next big upset after, um, <laughs> after Brexit? Let's go across the pond, shall we? <laughs> um, Il Popolo Veneto is an Italian uh, satirical, satirical magazine. It is quite funny. I just loved this. And I thought, yep, I know exactly what you're saying. Any language, any language which we'll give it to you. And I, I find this, this guy who blogs, you can just imagine him sitting there with his pile of pizza cartons and his, you know, what not sitting there. Uh, and so he wrote a report on, um, the, on, on what, a satirical report on what had happened in the US with the incoming uh, president. But this was written uh, before we knew that the orange one was going to be the president. And... Um, so, <laughs> a few little lines. Uh, he does a sort of a mock interview of, uh, that he'd had with uh, Donald Trump um, and reports on 14th of October 2016 in Greensboro, Greensboro uh, North Carolina. Uh, during what pundits described as his most unhinged speech to date, Donald Trump told supporters, today we prepare for the arrival of a comet which would make the galaxy great again. <laughs> I think I have to do this, don't I? Uh, Trump said the comet was discovered by amateur astronomer Marvin Shekel. Shekel 
Gruber of Forlorn Hope, Mississippi, <laughs> who named it Trump Pence in honor of the heroes of the Republican ticket. This is the biggest, best, most beautiful comet that ever came out of the Oort cloud, said Trump. Trump explained the comet will appear in the heavens the week before the election, pretending his victory over crooked Hillary and a secretive international cabal of bankers, Jews, women, educated people, immigrants, <laughs> space aliens, establishment Republicans, dermatologists and of course Paul Ryan who have all handed together, banded together to say very horrible things about him and imply that he was not perfect. Uh, Mr. Trump told excited supporters the comet would usher in a new era in the solar system and eventually the entire Milky Way galaxy. So that's fine. So you know we're all happy happy bunnies now and uh, we're all going to be safe uh, after we've had the orange one come in even our state German friends made comment the end of the world so what can I say uh, I love this particular quotation from uh, from Alice Roosevelt daughter of Teddy Roosevelt <laughs> You're, you're lucky. I had another cartoon of him wrestling somebody to the ground in a boxing ring with the hair everywhere, but for some reason it just corrupted on the system. So I, so I find this one, which I think is rather lovely, don't you? Anyhow, and all is not bad because comets do not always bring bad news. We have good news uh, from the new uh, U.S. ambassador to the U.N., uh, Nikki Haley, um, who has been... Of course, lots of puns made about her being the, 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 the comet Haley and Haley's comet and all that sort of thing. And she is being, if you read what's going on in the sort of uh, in the political arena in the States, uh, saying that once somebody either shoots Donald Trump or or he's impeached or he just takes off and goes to visit the Oort Cloud, uh, <laughs> uh, she may be the next U.S. president. But I don't know. That would possibly be the voice of sanity in a mad mad world so anyhow drawing near the end no idea how long I've been speaking uh, and neither has the director so he can't yeah, he can't boo me out here uh, he did ask that I, I would uh, include a, a few things of what's been happening recently because you haven't really had much about politics lately and I'm sure you're desperate for some political <laughs> news so we had I find this in the Sun always a good source of inspiration um, I and our, uh, the Labour leader was campaigning in Islington and it was all a bit stage managed just the way these things are and then this voter suddenly came up from the left and this is the geezer on the far left here with the, the microphone he runs a blog site and uh, is a sort of local reporter though because it goes online he has a massive readership and he sort of came right up to um, to Jeremy Corbyn and said, well, actually, matey, and it's on live. I'm not voting for you, and I wouldn't vote for you because of this, that, and the other. And the whole stage managed production just crashed and burned all around him. So I was really uh, keen to sort of run this presentation by the director, as uh, all the other people have done. And uh, would I? in my innocence ever put up a presentation that the director hadn't seen before I mean you just don't do that yes that's really naughty so uh, I tried to call them and, uh, and and say you know do you want me to ping this across and Dropbox and let you have a look but I'm afraid he was busy again <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's not one of mine <laughs> anyhow uh, thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for listening I hope you enjoyed my little romp through politics arts. Thank you. Thank you.